Hey, yo, what's up, happy people? I'm Robert Arrington, this is Deer Meat for Dinner, and you are watching Campfire Stories. This is my little brother, Blue Gabe. I promised you guys every Monday I was gonna upload a podcast, just a way that we could all hang out, tell you stories, and relive what got us here. Now, my little brother had never made a video in his life other than maybe on his phone up until about July of last year. What uh, what you think about that, Gabe? Dude, I don't even know how to describe. So the biggest thing, like sitting here right now, I've made like 125 videos, 150 videos. It's still intimidating being in front of this camera. You got Austin <laughs> back there looking at me like I might be saying something wrong. I think the first thing we should talk about is just being comfortable, the power of editing. I know on some of Robert's old videos, I've gotten that, oh, my personality sucks, or my personality is terrible, or you look like a jerk, Gabe, we don't even want to watch you. It, it's so hard to live life and do these things that we do and always be happy and spunky. I mean, the power of editing, we can, you can make me look good or bad real quick. Yeah, that's a fact. And in some of Robert's videos, when he put me on there, that was just real life. like. When we were tasting the lobster in one of the lobster videos and I just looked like the biggest prick in oh, the world. Oh, that's the lobster corn dog video. I, I, so what y'all didn't know about that video is I've done five up and down 85, 90 foot dives and had the biggest migraine in the world. And he knows I don't like cilantro. So I'm sitting there, <laughs> I don't know what he's filming and gonna use or not. So I'm sitting there like, my head's killing me and he hands me a plate of food with cilantro in it. I'm like, take this back. Cause he's my brother. I can talk yeah. to him like that. I didn't know he was gonna put it on film though. It is what it is. You know, one of the biggest things that I'm I'm proud of and shocked with, with Gabe, and if, if any of you watching this don't know already, he started a channel called Blue Gabe. And uh, we'll get into how it became Blue Gabe, but I mean, all the way up, we, we've always been a serious family, like whether we're diving or hunting or fishing or just walking around the house, you gotta be ready now to go hard. And my dad was never like Mr. Easy, ever. I mean, I remember playing baseball as a kid. He would hit us these fly balls like a million miles high. One day I'm like 11, running back, got it, got it, got it, got it, pow, pow catch it directly in my eye socket. Luckily, it didn't pop my eyeball out of my head. I fall down on the ground, nearly concussed. Dad yells, that's why I gave you a glove. Here comes another one, pow! I mean, it's just like, that's the life we live. That's why I believe wholeheartedly me, Aubrey, and Gabe have become successful in life because when we wake up in the morning, we don't expect things to be fair. We just expect to have an opportunity and we're going to get it. And when not life knocks you down, when, when life knocks you in the eye, shake it off and roll, man. And, um, you know, Gabe as a kid was just psycho. The baby of three boys, the youngest. Always pampered. My mom and dad pampered him. You're crazy. Con you ever seen the runt in the litter that like gets shoved over to the side? <laughs> it was dog eat dog my whole entire life. So now, even with dad, I worked with my dad my whole life before YouTube, all the way up until the day I just said I gotta start YouTube. There was no like, if you follow my channel and you see how I am with my kids, I don't baby them. But I'm 10 million times softer on my kids than dad was on us. There, 100%. I mean, there was times I'm like, people are gonna call HRS on us for sure. But we didn't look at it like we were getting abused. Like, yeah. Spankings? I'd much rather have gotten spanked when I was a kid than get grounded. So I'm like, I'm just gonna take this butt whooping with the best of them right yeah. now and yeah. keep moving. But that built us into who we are now. Now when something bad happens to me, I get pissed off mad and in three minutes I'm over it. That's it right. Falls back to those spankings when we were young. Hey, we did something wrong, we got dealt with. But we also know respect and everything else that made us the men who we are. Correct, correct, correct. The fact that someone can't get popped in the mouth nowadays for being a, an idiot is kind of a bad you thing. See kids in stores throwing fits and oh, I saw an Instagram video the other day. A kid arguing with his dad. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that would just that wouldn't have worked. Nope. 
But anyway, you know, Gabe, a lot of you guys have, I mean, I'm gonna go through Instagram here. I mean, we're here for y'all. We would, I wouldn't be living in this house and having this opportunity if it weren't for you guys. So. Hold on, I gotta say one thing real quick. Okay. For, you, for those of y'all that follow me and have seen me on Robert's channel, just know that pre-YouTube, the, like the week before I started YouTube, I had never owned a computer, had just gotten a smartphone really, never had MySpace, just gotten into Facebook and Instagram. So I was this guy that was just deer hunting, hog hunting. I mean, no yeah. tech savvy to it at all. To this day, I call Robert, I'm like, bro, I don't even know how to do this fade right here. He's yeah. like, watch YouTube, click, hangs yeah. up on it. <laughs> so y'all think, I like rode his coattail or something. Ask him about times I call him. Gabe, I gotta go, click. Yeah, oh so Sorry. no, it's, that's true. The biggest thing that I'm proud of with Gabe is, he was like, I'm gonna start YouTube. We've lived parallel lives. I mean, everything that I do, he does. Everything he does, I do. And we can pretty much say the same thing for Aubrey. We just, this is what we do. Gabe has his own little, nuances i have mine and aubrey has his but together we're running down the track neck and neck together but what i was most proud of with gabe is man forever you so many people talked about in the questions and comments why does he always look so mad why does he look confused what youtube has brought out all the great personality in gabe you used to never smile for pictures you were very quiet um i mean like literally you had all that drive and enthusiasm and passion, but it just was locked up inside of you. YouTube has just opened that up. And so many people say, hey, what's the, what's the secret to someone wanting to start a YouTube channel? <laughs> Go do it, there is no secret. Me and Gabe talk all the time, you can't figure this out. It's not like you can figure YouTube out. I you can tell you what you gotta do is plan on working about 100 hours plus a week. No sleep, no, no days off, no, yeah. well, I'm just gonna kick it with my family today, not zero. Super duper duper hard, but it, you know, everything that's hard is also worth it. We've, you know, people say, oh, you know, how, why? So there's one question in here. I'm gonna find it in a second. I don't remember who asked it. I gotta find out who asked it. Um, well, we're, we're gonna go down some of these questions real quick. Uh, this one is from uh, Montague Double O M O N T E G zero zero. All men die, but few men really live. I've heard you say this before, Rob. Can you explain what this means to you and how your viewers can truly live? All right, great question. Way back in the day, I had a roommate named Brian Hart, and he would always make this statement: "Let me live, let me live, let me live," and it referred to something other than living. It was, it was a crazy statement. But I, just, I started thinking to myself, that's not really living, you know? I wanna live, I want to live, like live. And at that moment in life, I was young kid living in an apartment with a roommate, I had no money, really didn't even have any direction in my life. And I was thinking, man, you know what? I want to live. I was like, everyone dies but I want to live and, and, that, and I, that morphed into all men die, few ever really live. I want to be one of them, I want to live. I want to go places, I want to see things, I want to do things, I want to, I want to live. And that just, that whole motto has morphed into my life. So what is living? Living is waking up every day, not considering yourself a victim. No matter where you are in this world, you have an opportunity to do something. And whatever that is, whatever your opportunity is, however little or big it is, to do your best with it. Because if you have a ton of opportunity and only do a little bit with it, that's not good. But if you have just a little bit of opportunity and you use it all, you start growing that opportunity, you start stretching it. And over time, you start building the opportunity and doing more and more and more. That's called living. And so for all of you out there, no matter how little or how big your opportunity is, use it and go for it and live. That's living. I get a lot of uh, comments sometimes saying that, oh, you guys are fortunate. I'm gonna tell you something about my dad. 
at nine years old had to start life from nothing. Yeah. Zero. I don't care if you're white, black, purple, or orange, where you come from in the world. No person on this planet had it worse than our dad yeah. at nine years old. He was actually younger. Dad was five. When dad was put on the bus, he was five. Yeah. All right, so at five years old, he might as well just say, well, life's over and I got to start again. And yeah. everything, this beautiful house, what we have came from a man at five. That was abandoned. Nothing. Abandoned, yeah. Zero. Basically, my dad and his two brothers were put on a bus to go live with someone in Florida. Did not have shoes. And the, the most shocking uh, statement I've ever heard dad say is, he wished he could find the driver of that bus that stopped and bought him and his brother shoes. That's not hyperbole, that's actual fact. And you know, you, a small gesture like that, to, now clearly to that bus driver that stopped and bought my dad, and they, they were four, five, and six. No, dad was four, because dad's the youngest of the brothers. It was four, five, and six, three little boys put on a bus to come to Florida. Dad wind up meeting my mom when they were in middle school or early high school, dated all the way. My dad wound up living with her. They got married as soon as they graduated high school in 1969. Through thick and thin, for better or worse, for richer or poor, they stuck it out. They, they lived it, fought it, and raised us boys. And uh, that's, that's why I say the real privilege is family privilege. If you have a family who loves you, you are privileged. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't have got us where we're at if he would have sat around and said, "Oh, I was, I was, thirty-five years old before I heard that story, and I worked with my dad for twenty years." Yeah, yeah. He never boo-hoo me, cried. He told me that on the way to a deer hunting trip. Yeah, on a <laughs> on a trip that you got left in the uh, gas station, I think. Yeah. Tell him <laughs> that story. So these are just stories that are crazy. This Get, is probably, I wouldn't have even have thought about that one. So this is probably my funniest all time story ever. I would say one of them. One of them. I have a Dodge Mega Cab, white four door, big, huge back seat. We put a memory foam in there, lay the seat down, huge bed. I'm six foot tall and I can lay back there and sleep like a baby. My dad's getting older, so I'm like, dad, I'm gonna drive. We're headed to Humphreys, Missouri on a deer trip like 21 hours. I'm like, Dad, I'm gonna drive through the night as hard as I can. When I wake up, you can, or, no. I'm gonna drive through the night as hard as I can. I'm gonna wake you up and then you can drive the rest of the way. So I drove to like three in the morning. We're 180 miles from the farm. I woke Dad up, it was, like I said, about 3.45 a.m. I'm like, I can't go no farther. He said, I'm good. We're, <laughs> we're pulling a golf cart. <laughs> I'm like, whatever you do, don't stop and wake me back up. Cause literally we timed it to where when we left Stewart, Florida, we could get to Humphreys hour before daylight, get dressed, go to our tree stands and hunt. He's like, all right, I won't wake you up again. He drives like eight minutes. I fall asleep. He wakes me back up at a gas station. Of course I throw one of my famous fits. I'm like, why did you just stop? Then I thought about him like, I don't have any Gatorade or snack for my tree stand and I plan on hunting all day. So I went in the store too, behind him, but he didn't know I got out. I come get my stuff, go take a leak, come back out. I'm like, hey, he must be washing the windshield. <laughs> he must be washing the windshield around back. <laughs> I go around back, he's not there. I come back in and I'm like, did y'all happen to see where that white truck pulling the golf cart and two big old truckers? I'll never forget it. They're like, was it white pulling a black golf cart? I'm like, yeah, he goes, it's headed west on whatever highway that is. I'm like, <laughs> oh heck. <laughs> Dad had just got an iPhone and when he got in the back seat to go to sleep, I flipped it over and turned it on silent so it didn't wake <laughs> me or any, just didn't bother anybody. I was still married at the time, so I'm, I'm like, he ain't gonna hear it. He's gonna drive all the way to the farm. He thinks I'm sleeping in the back. <laughs> So I called the police. I'm like, you guys, we got a problem. We got to stop this truck headed west towards Kansas City, Missouri. They're like, are you a runaway? I said, hell no, I'm not a runaway. My dad thinks I'm sleeping in the back seat. <laughs> stop him. So I'm like, just stop him. He's coming toward y'all because I knew where, where he was going. I knew the next down. The guy called me back. He's like, 
Sir, no truck has come by here with a golf cart. I'm like, how are y'all supposed to stop criminals if you can't see my dad driving down the road? <laughs> Long story short, I think it was like an hour and 45 minutes later, my dad calls me, he goes, where are you? I'm like, where the hell do you think I'm at? I was sitting in the gas station where he left me, but oh my god! But the the part that really starts to come around is when he turns around to come back and get me. It's 28 degrees, and I'm wearing this outfit, but in board shorts. I sat there. I'm like, it's time to take responsibility. You can't always blame everybody else. It was mostly my fault because I didn't go and say, Dad, I'm out of the truck. So I had already calmed down. He picked me up. He's like the saddest person in the world. I'm like, Dad, turn around. Let's go. We're fine. I got to Humphreys, Missouri at like 9.30 in the morning, went straight to my tree stand and killed a coyote with my bow, yeah. missed a big gobbler, and then killed one of the biggest bucks I've ever killed by 11 o'clock in the morning. So it was just meant to be. I've always loved that story. That's, that's one of the craziest stories ever. I got ever. left at a gas station for four and a half, five hours. But it was my fault, and I killed a huge buck. So. Okay, that's awesome. Hey, here comes another question. I'm just going to go down these questions real quick. This is Turf Tech. Most surprisingly good wild animal fish you've cooked and tried, and the worst one you just couldn't stomach. Okay, best one for you. The best surprising one? Yes. Animal or fish? Animal or fish, surprising. Javelina. All day, every day, and twice on Sunday. Javelina was the best meat I've ever put in my mouth. Really? And this one, I called you when I was getting, you were in Saipan still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I called him, I'm like, I'm gonna cook some javelina. And he's like, oof. Be careful. That's the, uh, the one I ate was terrible, like foul. Yeah, I, as soon as I cut into mine though, I was careful, I didn't hit any of the glands and I smelt the meat, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. But I never expected it to be that good. Uh, on, the same, on the same level, the marsh rat, the uh, nutria that we ate down in, down in Argentina, that was, I mean, if, if you would have just given me that meat, I would have been like, wow, that's amazing. I wouldn't even know what it was, but I would have said it was amazing. And so Nutria for me was surprisingly good. And the worst ever thing that I've ever put in my mouth was the mud fish. I literally gagged, like almost threw up. I'm trying to think what my worst was. I haven't tried mud fish yet. Well, think about we'll it later. We'll get back to that. Okay. When are you and Gabe both gonna head down to my hometown of Belize? Hey, that's great. Um, I'm all about traveling right now. I love my hometown. We have a beautiful infrastructure here. We have our boats, we have the ranch. We have lots of really cool stuff that we can do here. But since I was a little kid, like coming out of high school with no money, no nothing, I would always say to myself, well, if I save up enough money, I could fly there and just fly straight back because that means I've actually been there. And that's how bad I've wanted to travel. Now that we're financially able to save money and do these trips, um, I wanna go everywhere. Like, I wanna go everywhere. So wherever you're watching this from, if you think it would be cool for me and my family and my crew to fly down and, and do some cool videos and do a series there, hit us up. Just leave it in the comments below and tell us where you think we should go and what we should do. And man, I wanna go see it. I want to see the world. Uh, and Belize is definitely on that list. What about you, homie? One of my favorite trips I've ever been on, ever. Robert, like always, when we were young, would call me. I had the Nextel flip phone. You, you gotta be ready and be here, let's go. I'm like, what crap. <laughs> we fly into Cancun, Mexico, and where did we go? Uh, Isla Mujeres. Isla Mujeres. For one, I had one of the best meals I've ever had in my life. So we get on this boat, it's rough as snot. Huge giant rollers with big chop on top of that. And we went out and found giant bait balls of sardines with just dozens and dozens of sailfish yeah. crashing us. And that video is, that was like one of your first YouTube videos. No, that but was But it on, wasn't a real YouTube yeah, video. Yeah, it was, I, I just put it up on YouTube, but I will, I will have some cutaways of that on this. We were literally, that was one of the most amazing things ever. And we we're looking to go back down there and do that again. Just, balls of sailfish eating so close that we could catch the bait. I remember catching a bait, a sardine off my shoulder because it was trying to hide on me, holding it out and a sailfish eating it out of my hand. Like The most memorable thing to me was I was filming for Robert in the, the we were on a sport style boat, a big boat inboards. He backs down to the bait ball and goes, get in. Well, 
That's how we're raised. We just pile in the water. Well, when I got in, he clicked it forward and pushed all the bubbles up underneath me. And when the bubbles cleared, the, a few of those sardines came to me and sailfish were beating the snot out of me. I'm like trying to beat them like, off the camera. This close, like yeah, as close like, as we are. Bills, I'm like, get! And then on top of us, <laughs> we had giant birds with eight foot wingspans pecking on top of us trying to get them from the surface. That trip was insane. Yeah, okay. Short, sweet. Uh, next question. I'm trying to just bang right through this because there's so much. Jack H underscore fish. I'd love to hear how your relationship with God has made you two into the men you are today. Um, that's a great question, man. Ever since I was a little kid, God isn't like a pie in the sky to me. God is as real as like this. It's as real as like I can feel my hand. It's as real as it's as it's just as real as it could possibly be. That being said, um, it creates a box. It creates like uh, it creates walls for me to live in. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. And when you know what's right and wrong, you, it gives you direction in life. You try to live and do what's right. And more importantly, it makes you grateful. I believe in Christ. I believe in Christ dying on the cross for my sins. And it gives you faith. Something yeah. To look forward to. Yeah. It's it's the peace that passes all understanding. It's Man, it's sun in the storm, and it's, it gives you something to be grateful for. He paid it all for me, for me. Therefore, I'm grateful for what I have. When you are grateful for what you have, you appreciate it. And, and you want to bring, bring people around you, and you want to do things with people, and you want to do as much as you can. You want to live. And so that's how, that's how God has influenced me. I don't you know. can't look at somebody else though in their relationship with Christ and say, and compare your relationship or say, oh, I want to do what he does. You got to do it yourself. Yeah. And I've had people ask me before, well, why do you believe in God? And I, my simple response is, is, why not? Like, what do you get from not believing? Yeah. By me believing, I get that if, when I die, I go to heaven for eternity. Like, yeah. In this world, me and Robert doing YouTube, we're like, oh my God, we're running late, we're running late, we're running late, we're running late, popping out videos fast as we can. Eternity means forever. Yeah. We won't be in any rush. But by not believing, you you get nothing. Yeah. If I'm wrong, I end up in the same wooden box as you end up in. Yeah. But if I'm right, we get eternity. Yeah. And if you ever get, just sit down and pray, whether you're scared in the woods or now, that doesn't mean you can say, oh, my mom's got cancer, let me pray, and it's going to go away. That ain't how that works. But if you're ever just sad or depressed or a woman's got your heart or Whatever. you're scared of the dark, and you sit down and you get personal and pray, if that doesn't make you feel better, then you can message me back and say I'm wrong. Right. But I promise you, if you get sincere about that, and I've been in the woods scared a couple times, I've been in life, and I have one big story that will leave for another one with YouTube where... I kept doubting, and the second I quit doubting, things went good. And I'm telling you, I get more than you by not believing. Yeah. Because if you're right and I'm wrong, I end up in the same place you are. If I'm right and you're wrong, I get eternity. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving right along. Young underscore DDJ. What motivates you to get up and fish every time you do? What made it, what motivates me to get up and fish? Getting a bite, figuring out how to go get a bite. Doesn't matter if I'm fishing on my dock for tilapia and bluegill, or if I'm traveling offshore catching broadbill swordfish and blue marlin, or anything in between. I am motivated to get the bite. However I have to do that, I want to go get the bite. And it, that's just a passion inside of me that will never, never die. What this, about you? Hold on, I want to reflect real quick. So that question, reflects to Robert's Instagram post. For those of y'all that follow Robert on Instagram, he posted three pictures and all three pictures, I'm like dead not serious. What y'all don't realize is when we hunt this place called the Corbett area, it's 68,000 acres with some of the roughest, hardest hunting there is. And I'm the one that loads the buggy, gets everybody, and my job is to take them to their stands pick. You gotta realize that in them pictures, I had the weight of everybody that was hunting with me I want everybody to succeed. Like that's my goal in life. 
So in that picture, was I smiling? No, I should have probably been smiling, but I also that night had had to think about where's Robert sitting, where's the, everybody sitting. He was not worried where I was sitting. I actually wanted to sit somewhere else. And I'm pretty sure I drove you there and dropped you no, off. No, you did not. I drove I you wanted off to the fence. I know to a T where I I you wanted off. to sit where I killed the nine pointer the year before. And you were like, no, you're not sitting there. Just, just walk over there and climb a tree. And you dropped and me off worked? the, yeah, it worked. That's my point. So, <laughs> in, that, in that picture that night, I had dealt with mosquitoes and heat like you'd never imagine, dragging multiple deer out. I actually can remember killing that. I shot the, no, I shot the buck first, and then I heard something coming through the woods and, and a coyote eating palmetto berries, I shot him. So we had to do a little bit of fawn control with the coyote. What's the next question? Next question. KD Zags, KD Zags, has the dynamic between you two changed since Gabe joined YouTube? Do you think the competition amongst yourselves push you to make better content? I don't even look at any, I get that question a lot. I don't look at competition with YouTube. Like, yeah, so has the dynamic changed between you two? Yes, absolutely, I would say the dynamics changed. What does because that mean? Has the dynamic, so like has the dynamic, when you were running Bobcats for dad and I was making videos and working in the outdoors, we had a different dynamic because we couldn't communicate. I didn't understand running heavy equipment. You didn't understand making, making videos and shooting. You could never understand the amount of work. Like whenever you were running Bobcats and I would say, I'm working, you never, appear, you, you never thought of it as work the way now you think of it as work. You never thought of about how much time and effort goes into it. So we never had that dynamic while you were working heavy equipment. Well, I was, understand. now you understand we can relate with one another. Oh, this is what I'm doing. Like there's a lot of things that we've done. Um, oh, like in YouTube there, we have a, we have a big respect for each other. If, if I'm trying to do something, he won't come and get on top of me. If he, if I know he's got something hemmed up, and he's waiting to get it all right. I'm not going to go. Stingray video. Yeah. I said, when I saw that Stingray, Robert, when I first started doing YouTube, said I want to do a Stingray video. The night Sarah and I did the bow fishing video together, we saw one that night. And I'm like, nope. Robert said he wanted to do one. But right. a whole year goes by and I seen that one swimming by yesterday. Wham! Right. And I did it. You just have to have a little bit of respect. Yeah. We, we try to keep video, we try to keep from doing like all of our summer videos in summer. We try to space them out instead of keeping everything going. I do watch what Robert does just so I'm trying not to like step on his toes and him step on mine and we communicate that way. Yeah, we, uh, it, but, but I think it's made our relationship way better. But I think more importantly, more than, yeah, our relationship is the best it's ever been. But more importantly, your relationship with everyone in the world is better than it's ever been. He smiles now, your whole personality. But it wasn't personality. like I was mean before. I was just more of a serious person. I took, I took pride in being the best I could be at what I was doing at that moment. Now I realize I had to back off of that a little bit and show some personality. I was never mean by any means. Yeah, okay, so. Unless he made me mad, then I could have been real butthole. Uh, this is Reese. R E S O L C E B at Deer Meat for Dinner at Blue Gabe. My question is how much meat is typically stored and frozen in your freezer at any given time, and at what point do you feel it necessary to fill it again? Also, why is Gabe so scary in all these throwback photos? Ha ha ha. So, first off, let's talk about the freezer. I typically keep very little meat in my freezer. Uh, if we kill a deer or hog or fish or whatever, I will clean it. I'll keep enough for three or four or five days. I'll eat it during that time and I give it away. My neighbors, my friends, people that I know or just random people that I know need meat. I'm always going out giving people meat, taking care of people. Um, and also like fishing offshore, very, very rarely do I go out and just smash a cooler full of fish ever anymore. I mean like up in Virginia that one day we caught 25 tile fish and a handful of dolphin but we split it up amongst all of us. So again, I had enough for a few days and we were good. And why is Gabe so scary? Because he's a scary guy. What about you? Yeah, I never keep. Last night at 9.30 at night, I sent my 10 year old and five year old down the street to give my neighbors some fish just because 
I don't like storing it. We fortunately live in an area where we can get it pretty much anytime we want. And as far as deer goes, when I kill a deer, it goes straight to my mom's house. Cause like last night, I was here yesterday and I pulled up to mom. She had fried deer meat, grits, and brown gravy ready. I'm like, this is why you get all my deer meat. That's what's going to heaven. Yes, <laughs> literally anytime I go there, she's gonna have a good meal cooked. Right. I will keep a little bit of deer meat, but very little. I have right now, I still have some of our moose from last That's year. That's what we ate last night. Moose is just so stinking good. Actually, moose is gonna be part of deer or Tasty Tuesday this week. Watch what happens there. Um, uh, here we go. Cody Hagwood. Cody Hagwood. I really want to hear this the whole popsicle stick ah, story. Don't even read for that Blue thing. Gabe I can't and explain Demi it because it gives me the you creeps any... hearing that word. <laughs> don't good. even talk about it. Let's just some things are better left unanswered. God. I I don't get this, you guys, at all. I have no you know what I have? It somewhat stems the, the only little thing that I can talk about. It's God dang it makes me grossed out, is you used to chew on them, but I can't even think about that. So I still like, chew on them. <laughs> Next question. No, I'm gonna Go talk about, hold on, this is, this is, so uh, growing up, I never had good grades. Like, I, I was never a problem in school, but I never made good grades. Ugh. And I would always get my report cards sent to the house and they would be in the mail. And I would always fear the mail so much because I knew I was going to get in trouble when I had a bad report card. To this day, I don't check our mail. I have a hard time checking email. It just something, I just hated the mail so bad for so long that I, ne I can know that I've got a check in the mail and won't go check the mail. That's a natural fact. That's why when I come around, I quit. So I'm also proof that if you want to be something, you can be it. In the ninth grade, I said, the heck with this. Uh, I don't expect you kids to do the same that might be watching but in the ninth grade I said the heck with school and I went to work and I came home and told my dad and he said I thought he was going to be really mad dad goes well get a job and as soon as you can get a down payment for a new truck I'll help you with it my dad could have told me to get out of the house or he could have been supportive when he told me to make enough money to get a down payment on a new truck I said for real I went and started catching live hogs, selling them for $50 a piece, and in two months, I was driving a brand new 1998 Toyota Tacoma. My dad didn't hand me anything, but he supported my decision. I've never drove a used truck in my life, and I've never not had money in the bank, and I've never not had a good job. Sometimes you just gotta make the decision to go the path you wanna go, put your head down and grind. And because my dad didn't, just kicked me out of the house that day and said, you're terrible. He said, you know what? I'm going to do some reverse psychology. He helped me buy a new truck. And he told me that the day I dropped out of school. And now look, yeah. I'm driving some really nice trucks, got boats and airboats and money in the bank and two healthy kids. And we're sitting in this awesome house. So yeah. it wasn't because I did anything less than worked as hard as I could up to this point. Yeah. And I mean, don't think we grew up with a wealthy dad. Me yeah. And me and Gabe both make more than dad growing up, I believe, I would I would imagine. Like dad struggled, man, like working he made his- good money though. He made good money, but he was always working. Like even when we would go on vacation, he would come home and work so that we could be on vacation yeah. down in the Florida Keys. I mean- Instead uh, of him buying fancy trucks like everybody else had, he would take us on vacation. That's right. Which made us the people who we are. 100%. He yeah. never had any fancy toys, he probably did get a bow every now and then, which you can't blame him there. A bow? Yeah, nice. Very bow. rarely. Yeah, but he always pushed to take us. I can remember every year he took us on at least two good vacations. And I'm sure he was counting pennies on the way. Yeah. Okay, here we go real quick. Krizia. Krizia, 829. What is your ultimate goal for deer meat for dinner? Have you reached it? What is my ultimate goal? To do the best I can today. I've never had a goal in my life. I am a day-to-day -day guy. I wake up each day and decide that I'm gonna do the best I can with what I have to do today. That's actually biblical. And whatever it is that I have to do that day, I do the best at it. And then the next day, I can repeat that process and day by day by day, I build something. Your life is just accumulation of days. So if you make a habit of doing your best every single day, it will put you in the position that you need to be in. Um, if I say to myself, 
ooh, I have this goal, I want to be here. And then I shoot for that, you may be, you may be going somewhere that, that you shouldn't be. But if day by day you do your best, it's going to take you where you actually should be. And that's my goal. My goal is to, to do the best I can today. And what do I have to do today? Doing this podcast. And we got to edit it. Then I got to film Tasty Tuesday. And we got to clean some of my fish. We got to clean some of his fish. When we're done with that, I got, um, I got uh, uh, Josh Carney coming into town this evening. We're going to go to the ranch. Hopefully, if it's not totally flooding. So every day I do my best. Then I go to sleep. Next day, do it again. Yeah, I don't plan either. That's what my goal is. do I ever plan. If you look at my trucks, it looks like the hunting section of Bass Pro, fishing poles, dive gear. Always. That's because when I walk outside, you'll never hear Blue Gabe say, um, I can't go because what I need is at the house. No, nope, I'll dig under the seat and find something and we out. Okay, Oxford Towney. Share a funny story of the three brothers getting into trouble with parents when y'all were kids. You can't do that because I don't even... The thing is, Aubrey's so much older than me, I have virtually zero memories as Aubrey as a child. Really? Zero. He was 11 years older than yeah. Gabe. I can tell you one funny story. I'll leave it. I'll leave that until I'm doing it. No, I will tell you one funny story. The first cuss word I ever heard Aubrey say in my whole life, we were at the beach. He was in the back of dad's old brown Ford pickup truck and he had his hands uh, in, you know, he's in the back of the truck, he had his hands like this, and mom slammed the door on his hand. <laughs> I can, I'll tell you a funny story about Aubrey. So Aubrey, obviously, is the cleanest version of the three of us. Really polite, really well-mannered. Everybody thinks he's like this peaceful guy, like he's real calm, he's professional. Go fishing with him and let him lose a fish. Yeah. Or miss the gap and see what happens. He goes plumb crazy Walt Arrington on you like that. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ricky Ricardo, 18. After all these years of living off the land and enjoying the outdoors, what part still gets you excited? Read that question again. After all these years of living off the land and enjoying the outdoors, what parts still gets you excited? What's everything excites me? There's nothing that doesn't excite me. Literally. Yeah, the, the relationships are what get me excited. Um, like going to Rota and killing that big sandbar deer and all my friends in Rota. I'm um, getting ready to go to Nebraska on a mule deer hunt. Go get, get to spend time with uh, Wyatt Russman and Scott Russman and one of my other friends, Brandon Alts. We're all gonna go out there. Yes, there's nothing like, I have an oak tree that everyone knows is my oak tree. I can guarantee you, I know if I'm alive where I'm gonna be sitting. That's such a blessed moment. I know how them deer come off that hill. I know where they cross. I know where they're gonna bed and I know how to get in between them. That's great. But the relationships, that's the best part. Going out, spending time with people, just that that love and fellowship, that, that, that's, I think you took that question out of context. No, I didn't. said did. living off the land, nothing about friends. After all these years of living that off the land and enjoying the outdoors, what part still gets you excited? The people traveling all over. That ain't had nothing to do with living off the land. He's talking about harvesting animals and I catching answered, fish, didn't he? Do you remember, okay, Ross Pittmanzer, do you remember being that young? Shoot. What? <laughs> Remember being what young? Yeah. How young we were in those pictures. Heck yeah, man. Oh, I can tell you each one of those three pictures, like down to the T. I was the buck that I'm holding, the first picture, the buck that I'm holding, we were actually in the sugar cane because a good friend of ours, Ryan. Ryan Ward. Yeah, Ryan Ward. God, I don't know why I had a brain fart. His little brother, Clint Ward, had just gotten killed in a car accident. I can remember the, the road we're driving down and that buck come running in front of us and he was running towards the corporate area where we can legally hunt too, but it's a different hunting area. And I shot the buck right before and he went into the corporate area and I had to go in there and blood trail him and I thought I'll never find him, but I do everything dead nuts serious, everything. So I went in there ready for him and I looked up and I caught one glimpse of him going and I shot and killed him. And, uh, I think we brought him back. That picture was in Jupiter Farm somewhere. But that's a big corporate area in the earth. Yeah. And 
Mine, that same deer that I killed. Let me look at the picture real quick. I know what deer that is. That deer came walking down the road, trailed up a doe. Next thing you know, he came running back by. I stopped him at 15 yards and drilled him. Which deer was it though? What, you losing I, my spot, goofball. That's my phone, not oh. yours. What's the third picture? Hold on, I can't lose my spot. I'm in a, okay. Um, okay, Isaac Tots. Isaac's Tots. Most memorable hunt. What's your most memorable hunt of your life? Mm. Oh God, there's so many of them. The most emotional hunt of my life wasn't with me. It was that turkey hunt with Jake. That was awesome. My big bull elk, probably my first big bull elk, just because I was sitting there in a tree thinking, I ain't even gotta pay attention. There's nothing can sneak up on me. Cause I walked in there and it sounded like an elephant and I was walking quietly and all of a sudden all heck broke loose below my tree and there's a 600 pound big six by six bull elk underneath me and he runs off and he turned and came back. But I was ready for it the second time and I killed him with my bow. But I thought to myself, how did that huge animal get here? And I never heard him and it was ghost quiet. There was no wind, there was no nothing. I never heard him until he ran out from under my stand. Uh, my most memorable hunt of my life was the sandbar deer this past year, just a few months ago on Rhoda. Uh, I actually went to Rhoda in 2018 with PK Hawkock. Uh, I went there to take PK home and while I was there, I got to hunt with my bow. Um, I killed a, a, a doe while I was there. And I went back in 2020 this summer and had the opportunity to hunt. I uh, killed a big sandbar deer. It, the whole way that we built the slings out of towels and rope and hunting with just one of the most blessed human beings I know, Mr. Pete Hulkalk and Kelvin Ogo. Right now, Kelvin, I call him Uncle Kale, he is in San Diego getting surgery done on his jaw. He got oral cancer. But the friends that I have in Rhoda, the friends that I have in the CNMI make that hunt stand out in my life. And number two would be the bull on Poggin, hunting the bull with my bow. Those two hunts are like one hunt to me. The bull on Poggin, the sandbar deer on Rhoda. It's, the, it's what life's about right there, man. Unbelievable. Okay, okay, next. Uh, Dan motivates. Why does Gabe look so serious? That you, there's like 50 questions yeah, about that. Yeah, because you posted three consecutive pictures of me looking serious, and you look serious in the pictures too. But they, because you're Mr. Dear Me, they don't call you out. They just want to call me out. If you look in the pictures of Robert, he looks just as serious as I am. Okay. But I had probably just drugged the deer for him while he bossed me around, so I had a, a more legitimate excuse than him. Is he still talking? Okay, Maltito underscore Arnedo. This is, I was looking for this question. Robert, you said you were broke at your apartment and you thought of deer meat for dinner cause you love deer meat. And so you started your YouTube more or less. Why did you start a YouTube channel instead of getting a regular job? What made you choose YouTube as a job? Ha, here we go. This is a wonderful question. And it was February 27th, 2013. First off, whenever I started YouTube, like I, no one thought of it as a job. I thought of it as a career path. I knew that it had the potential, but it took a few years before I started making money. Now, shortly thereafter, just a few months into YouTube, Everglades worked a deal out with me, but that was my only deal for a long time. Whenever I would tell people I was a YouTuber and that's what I was doing as a career, even Aubrey, Aubrey told me, bro, stop this. You're spending so much time on this. But to keep myself afloat, I would guide gator hunts, I would take people fishing, and I, I started running a big sport fishing boat for family again. But I never stopped. I did YouTube for at least three years before it started making money. And then in around April of 2016, I went full time at it. And, and it's, it's been on a pretty significant role since then. But why did I, I didn't, I didn't just say, oh, I quit. I'm doing YouTube for a living. No. That's what I did. <laughs> That's what Gabe did. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. But no, I worked for like 
I continued doing my bobcat work for two and a half, three months. Okay, Dylan Lancaster, growing up so close to your brother, what is your biggest pet peeve about each other? What's your biggest pet peeve? I, I saw that question. I didn't really know how to answer. I don't get pet peeves. Like, yeah. I'm the type of person that I can be fighting mad, ready to kill everybody in the world, and in three minutes be over it. Yeah, the same. If you let me thing. just scream, and even Kelly now and my kids will tell you, if you let me just get pissed off, real pissed off, in three minutes I'll have forgot why I was pissed off. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I don't have any pet peeves. I mean, pet peeves isn't even. A, I don't like that word. I don't like. Why did you leave that comment? And we're deleting that. Dylan Lancaster. No, I'm just I feel kidding. like I know Dylan Lancaster. Well, I don't. Let me see. Listen, we're not. I, I don't have any pet peeves. I just do my thing. Yeah, I don't either. Um, okay, what made both of you guys start hunting and fishing? Because that's it's the only. Blood. Yeah, of course. That was. Uh, we didn't have a choice. I mean, Migulon 408. My favorite thing in the world when I was a kid was to come outside and dad would have a deer or a hog out there. And it was like flies, just poof. Us kids, I can remember, dad, let me clean him. Yeah. And he never argued with us, he just let us do it. Okay, Tyler Stumbo. My question is why can't Blue Gabe take a regular picture? Always looking surprised. He obviously doesn't follow me on Instagram, <laughs> but now I'm a professional picture taker. Oh, here's a good one. Bear kill a 212. Who's better with a bow, you or Blue Gabe? Um, Gabe's killed deer way farther than I have. I think my farthest, my farthest actual bow kills are all in that upper 50s, lower 60s. Um, I've never been in the same thing though. I'm not in the competition. I don't yeah. like, I don't ever look at life as a competition. The only person I'm in competition with is myself. And it's I mean that with exact, all honesty. Exactly. I've killed deer at 110 yards with my bow. But I've never thought, oh, well, that dude did it at 111, so I want to beat it. Yeah. I don't care nothing about that deer size. One of my biggest bucks I've ever killed in my life, which is comparable to these. Three days later when I got home, I was hunting in a Palmetto flat in Arcadia, and a three-pointer come through the Palmettas, and I had buck fever so much worse than I did when I killed my giant Missouri deer. And I remember somebody saying, why'd you kill that little buck? I'm like, why in the hell are you asking me why I killed this? I'm free, 21 yeah. years old, and I wanted to. Yeah. I live life for me. Yeah, I, I, that's it. I try to be my best version of me, whether I'm hog hunting on the ranch or whether I'm hunting a bull on pogging or a whitetail in the Midwest or whatever. I, I know the bigger the moment, the better I shoot. The more, like sometimes. Yeah, little windows. Like if a deer comes, the deer I just killed in my last deer video, he's standing out in the open. I'm like, oh God, please don't miss. But it's 30 yards, so surely I'm not gonna miss. If that deer would have been in the Palmettas and I had a little window to shoot through, I'd have been like, he smokes city all day. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's all about the, like if I go out and I'm, I'm target shooting on a draw down, all I'm doing is I'm practicing on my anchor, touching my string with my nose, relaxing my hand, and I know, did that arrow go where it was supposed to go? I know if I was holding just a little high left, high left, high blow right, blah, blah, blah. I know, but once I'm in the woods and I know that my bow's in good shape, I never hope to see a deer. Like I never go to a tree stand going, man, I hope I see one today. I'm always expecting to see one. I'm, I'm always saying to myself, He's gonna come right there. And I've checked my wind. I said, okay, I'm pretty much giving up that spot. So I'm gonna see him here, I'm gonna see him there. If he comes here, if that deer comes, I'm always going through scenarios in my head, which way he's coming, what he's gonna do, if he gets right here, if he, blah, blah, blah. I'm just constantly doing that. It goes back to dad coaching us in baseball, constantly situational awareness. And so then whenever I see him, I'm not surprised. I'm not like, oh my gosh, there's a deer. It's, it's there, he, okay, there he is, now we're, okay. Just like I thought, he's going right there when he gets here, come tight. First thing I do, put my hand under my ear where it's supposed to do, nose on the string, let the arrow go. And, and that's just, you know, that's just me. I feel a million percent more confident shooting something that I'm after. Now, if I go out to the ranch, sometimes I get a little lackadaisical, it's a wild hog and I'm not, I'm not as 
fine-tuned and I make a bad shot, I, I'm like, so stupid, why, why did I, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a competition with myself. I am not thinking about anyone else or how anyone else would do it. I never pay attention to other people, ever. Yeah. But one thing I think we need to focus on real quick, let's stop questions for a second and talk about hunters. You said something a long time ago. So right now in this point in our world with everything that's going on, politics and everything, hunting is getting so much focus on it they're wanting to wipe our hunting out and you and i talked about it earlier yeah. even as far as some of our videos getting demonetized so robert always told me what do all anti-hunters have in common they all hate hunting they don't argue amongst each other about anti-hunting they just hate it all yeah hunters have become so argumentative amongst each other oh you shoot this bow that sucks you shoot those arrows that sucks you're a rifle hunter you're gay like you just Hunters have argued amongst each other now so bad, and us as YouTubers get the comments. Like, I get told that I'm an idiot for calling sand fleas sand fleas. Well, guess what? That's what we call sand fleas in Florida. So as hunters, if you're a hunter, you need to pay attention and realize that our sport is under attack. Mm -hmm. Big time, more now than ever. So instead of calling somebody out for being stupid for liking bow hunting rather than gun hunting, we need to start supporting each other. I don't care what you do. As long as you're not breaking laws and hurting bad things, you're a hunter, hey, I support you. Do it however you want. Because trust me when I say the people that are against us all stand together. And They're will unified. wipe us out, period. So if, you see, if you're on hunting groups and you see people are, like literally I've gotten off all hunting groups on Facebook because it's like a bunch of just little young boys and girls arguing and i'm like you guys are hunters just hunt have fun share pictures and support each other don't ask anybody how old the deer is because even you guys watching us now that think you know how these deer are you technically don't know how old he was because you weren't there the day he was born so just support each other and support this thing that we call hunting that we all love if not, it's going to go away, and they're taking it away one law at a time. I promise you. Okay. We've got to wrap this thing up here shortly, very, very soon. But I want to... Rod underscore Johnny. What has been the best adventure with one another? What's, a, what's an adventure when we were kids together? I'll tell uh, you. I remember one when I was little. I can remember the Palmetto Head. Dude, I was going to say the same thing with Shred in the... Yeah. In the I'm talking, I'm like five. Four, no, five, you six. would have been, I was probably 12 and you would have been eight. I was either 11 or 12. And Anyhow, he doesn't mention that there's a hog coming down the trail and his little brother's just, you guys don't know what the definition of tough love is. This is, this is how this hunt goes. We were on the Monreve Ranch. We had a little bobtail cur dog named Shred. And there was a little island, just a little, little palmetto head. I can about see as big right as now. this about as big as this office we're in. And Shred's in there baying, yow, 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 yow. and me and Gabe are, we're standing about, we're standing about this far apart, and I'm down trying to look in the palmetto, and like I said, he's seven or eight, and I'm 11 or 12, and I was not a big, I was a little 11 or 12 year old. I'm looking at, and man, this boar hog, no joke, busts out of them palmetto patch, we are about this far apart. He runs in between us, woo, hooks a left and runs down the, runs down the ditch bank, shreds doing 100 miles an hour, bays him up down there, and Gabe literally, he's standing there like this, he just falls to his knees. He goes like this, oh, catch him. <laughs> there was no, but back then, like, this day and age, you would have seen, oh, oh come here, let's get up. Hey, it was, if you didn't get up, you're left. So. Now, the, the moral of the story is, Shred would bait him up. I ran down there. We caught that hog, cut him, turned him loose, and that was the end of the story. But we barred that hog at 7 and 11 years old. Now, granted, he probably, looking back on it, he probably weighed 90 or 100 pounds. Might as well been 400, because that's the memory I got. Scared the hell out of me, run straight. I can remember it like it's a dream and I'm in this bubble. And it's just like right there. We have not talked about that in over 20 years. We've not mentioned that hunt. I can't hunt. remember anything leading up to it or after it. I can just remember that, like I can see it right now. 
I'm like, he caught me! <laughs> that is so great. Um, oh, goodness. And here's uh, uh, the show. Let me answer one online. Okay. Because I, I did a video the other day too that I'm going to do this, not like this, but on a little short video, Robert, me, and Kelly are going to answer some questions. I had one right here. Oh, what's with the necklace? What necklace? God, see, you just, never mind. Oh, barefoot. Why are we always barefoot? Let me say who said it. All right, hold on a second. Yeah, you asked that one. I don't know how to read that. Okay. Name. Deuce Bellard. Deuce dot Bellard. Why are y'all always barefoot in the woods? <laughs> That's just how. Yeah. You didn't want shoes. Like, if you had shoes, that was something else you had to keep up with, and you can be way more quiet, and you can be way more efficient until you get, wait a minute, vines. Yeah, then, there's times when they, they're terrible. You know, sometimes you're running in to catch a hog and it's palmettas and you're getting sawtooth palmettas between your toes or briars between your toes. But what I love about it is when you're walking in like sand, you can walk super quiet, barefooted in sand and grass and water. So if I've got shoes on, I walk through, there's always ponds and marshes and mud. If you walk through that with shoes on, then you come out the other side, it's like, <laughs> When I'm hunting with somebody that has shoes on, I keep looking back at them. I know I'm giving them a bad look like, bro, stop stepping on so much stuff. But I think it goes back to when we were kids living in that house right next door. I didn't want to find shoes. Like, up, out of bed, gone. Yeah. No need to worry about shoes. And now I just don't even pay no attention. But I do wear my sandals everywhere I go. Yeah, and with my foot, like my foot's been giving me a hard time. It's been real sore. I'm ate up with fire ants right now, but if you see me wearing shoes now, it's because my foot's sore. I have to wear some supportive whatnot. But uh, hey, listen, man, this has just been another campfire story. We're hanging out, having a good time. Gabe, I'm super proud of you, brother. If you want to see some beautiful pictures of me smiling, check out my Instagram, Blue Gabe. <laughs> You'll see this beautiful smile in a bunch of pictures. Oh, goodness gracious. This has been a lot of fun. I don't know if, it, hey, if you watch this entire podcast, please leave it in the comments below. And on my very first podcast ever, which was last week, we had over 80,000 views. That's crazy. How many will we get on this video? God only knows. But uh, that's all I got for you today, you guys. Take care, God bless, and we gone.